Every person comes into the world looking for one thing. A face. Beyond the shock and surprise of birth, we all look for a face. These are the words of Andy Crouch, who has written recently on what it means to be created in the, hum in the image of God, what it means to be a human before God. He's written on technology. I encourage you to read his books. But he describes this moment in the human life as the greatest drama of every human born. The moment you are born, you begin looking. And you are looking for a face. You are looking for someone who is looking back at you. And the truth is, part of knowing, part of knowing that you even exist, is seeing someone who sees you. In the moments in which we are born, what are we doing? We are crying. We want someone to see us, and we want someone to hear us. This is what it means to be human. It's what it means to be known. It's what it means to know that we are known. And to be loved as a human, which we all long for, we must be heard, we must be seen, we must be known. Hence, the importance of fathers. Because God has established that our security in who we are, that we exist, our identity in the world, He has established in the way the world works, that this is determined by fathers. The health of your identity and security in who you are is determined by a man who chooses to know you. A man who chooses to see you. A man who chooses to hear you. Fatherhood. God has implanted it in the world so that we would know who we are. We would have an identity. We would have a purpose in the world. And that comes from our dads. Now we need mothers to live that we're going to live, the security that we're going to remain alive comes from seeing and knowing our moms. But a healthy identity, knowing who we are, our purpose in the world comes from fathers. And without a proper, healthy love of a dad, we clamor for what? The same thing we cried out for when we were born. That someone would see us. That someone would hear us. That someone would know us. And the degree at which our dads saw us, heard us, knew us, is the degree we find ourselves in secure or insecure in seeking to be heard and seen and known in the world. That's where our insecurities come from. That's why so many of us are clamoring for attention. I just wish someone would see me. I wish someone would know I exist. We clamor to be heard and cared for and loved. I wish someone would hear me. And so much of loneliness is rooted in fatherlessness. Or a dad who's there who doesn't see, hear, or know their kids. In the United States of America, it is tragic that 18.5 million people live without fathers. We lead. Think about this with our culture. I said the sermon's going to be short. I don't know about that in this moment, but we'll try. <laughs> All of the crazy gender confusion in our culture, in the culture of the United States of America, it is no wonder that we lead the world in fatherlessness. We lead the world. Other countries understand the importance of fathers. When we come to our Bible, 
God has rooted the importance of dads in his redemptive story. In the Old Testament, God's name was revealed as I am who I am. The great I am. I keep my promises. Throughout the Old Testament, God was primarily revealed to his people as the creator, but also the redeemer, the promise keeper. And very few times is he referred to as father in the Old Testament. He's described at times as father. But very few rabbis would even utter to God the words, my father, our father, your father. That's why this Middle Eastern rabbi named Jesus from Nazareth, when he begins to walk around and pray, and he is talking to the Creator, the Redeemer, the Great I Am, and he is saying, Father. It was scandalous. It's what led him to be crucified and killed. He would say things like, me and the Father are one. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he referred to God, the Creator, Redeemer, Holy, Righteous God of the universe, as his Father. But he got even better than that. Because as he's teaching his disciples, he would turn around and as he's teaching them about their needs and what they need to survive and how they are to trust God, he would turn around and say things that, to them like, your Father, your Father in heaven knows what you need. Our Father, my Father, who is now your Father, will take care of you. And it is scandalous that Jesus would open the door to such a thing to his disciples. That the God of heaven, the creator, redeemer, who is his father, can be our father. And that's the good news of the gospel. And I want you to notice something as we begin to dig into the Lord's Prayer today. That before we get to the Lord's Prayer, beginning in verse 5, Jesus points out two things to his disciples that are so important when it comes to prayer. And the first is, God sees you. In verses 5 through 6, he is condemning the hypocrites, the religious hypocrites, those who are play acting in their religion. And what they like to do, we see in verse 5, is they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and on street corners. Why? So people see them. So that they are seen praying at high traffic times. They would go out and make sure they were seen in their prayer life. And he says, they get their reward because people see them. That's all they want is to be seen in prayer. But he turns around and he says, but when you pray, verse 6, I want you to go in a room and shut the door and pray. Notice, to your Father who is in secret. Now this is not the only way to pray, but he's proving a point. You don't have to stand up in front of everyone to get attention as you pray. Why? Because your Father who is in secret, notice the text, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What is the point there? You don't have to pray to be seen by men because your Father sees you. What are you longing for as a human? To be seen. That need is met in God Himself who sees you. And you experience that when you pray. And then in verse 7, not only does God see us, God hears us. He turns from the religious hypocrites to the Gentile pagans. And the way that they pray is with many words. And He says empty phrases. They go around babbling to idols. Gods, they don't even know who exists. They make up gods. They craft gods with their own hands and little wooden metal objects. And they battle to them. They use empty words. Why? Because the words aren't going to anyone, anywhere. They are useless. But why are they doing this? Why are they praying to these empty gods with empty words? Because they want to be heard. And so in verse 8, he says, Do not like, do not be like them. For your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask Him. So, before Jesus even gets to teaching us how to pray, He wants us to know that God 
sees us and God hears us. Well, that's why you should pray. Because in prayer, God meets the deepest longings of your soul to be seen by someone, to be heard by someone. Who else would you want to hear you? Who else would you want to see you? Who else would you want to know you? And this is the glory of the gospel. And he says, I want you to know God sees you and God hears you. And so then verse 9, here is how you should pray. In light of the fact that God sees you and hears you. Verse 9, pray then like this. Our Father. Now those words are so important. Both of them are so important. Our. Jesus is calling us to call his Father our Father, my Father. And, and he's in the group of his disciples. He says, together we have one Father. And today, he says to us today, in his word, you gather here today with Jesus and his Father is your Father. And so as we've already heard today so many times, how did that happen? Because the invitation is not to every human on the planet to call God their Father. Because we are born in sin. And we choose to call the shots ourselves and to do things our way. And the Bible describes us in our sin as spiritual orphans. When we get to the New Testament and Jesus turns around and he says, no, you, when you lie, you're acting like your father who is the devil, Satan. And so not everyone can just turn to God and say, he's their father. And so how does that happen? Well, it happens through this glorious act that we've heard described over and over today through adoption, our adoption in Christ. You see, the New Testament describes the gospel in the context of adoption. You have been adopted by God. How did that happen? Through adoption. Jesus dies on the cross for your sin that you can be forgiven and cleansed of all of your sin. Jesus lives a perfect, righteous life so that when you believe in Him, His righteousness is credited to you and you are covered in Him. This is the payment for your adoption. The credit for your adoption. Forgiven for your sins, covered in the righteousness of Christ. You can be adopted by God and become not like a son, but a son in the Son who is Christ when you believe in Him. When you trust in Him. You are justified, Paul says, as though you've never sinned and you always obey that is credited to your account. And when you believe in him, the spirit comes in and works in your heart, implants the gospel in your heart, and you are adopted. Everything it takes in the world to be a child of God has been done in Christ. Legally, positionally, in Christ. You are a child of God when you believe in Him. That is your adoption story. You didn't come into the world longing to see God, longing for God to hear you and be known by God. But in Christ, He sees you and He hears you and He knows you. Why? You are his child. The same way he sees, hears, and knows Jesus. Isn't that amazing? So today I want, you, I want to invite you today in prayer to rest in that reality that this would be the foundation of your prayer life. That you were adopted by God in Christ. And you stand before him as one who was once adopted. Now a son, a child, a daughter in Christ. And that is the foundation of your prayer life. So I invite you today, when you pray, it's a very practical application today. Begin calling God Father. You can do that. 
And the hesitancy, I was thinking about it all week, the hesitancy. Why do I have a hesitancy when I bow my head and say, Father? And I think in my own heart and soul, it's because I don't believe the gospel at times. And when I bow my head, I, I, holy, righteous God, those are things you should pray. They should be a part of your prayer life. Holy, righteous God, creator. But Jesus says you can call him Father. You should call him Father. And so as you pray, you have to realize as you reflect, Jesus has ushered you into the presence of God with the cross, through the cross, in his righteousness to be seen by the Father. And so when you start praying, Father, I know you see me. You see me in Christ. Because of his cross, because of his righteousness. Though I have sinned, I have been forgiven in Christ. I am covered in his righteousness and you accept me. One of the things I was reading this week, I think it was in an Andy Crouch book, where the question was asked of adolescents. What is one thing you would change about your parents right now? And the response overwhelmingly is this, that they would spend less time on their phones and more time talking to me. Isn't that earth-shattering, mind-blowing? It shouldn't be when we understand that's what our children long for, is that we would see them and talk to them. Now think about your Father in Heaven. It kind of flips, right? That you would spend less time seeing the screen and just reflecting on the fact that He sees you and you're covered in Him. And that means when you pray, when you ask, He sees you. He's not pushing you away. He's not shunning you. The difficulty, the trial that you offer up to Him, you can stand there and offer that up to Him. Father, here it is. I know that you see me. You're not shunning me. There's purpose in what I'm going through. But here it is. Reflect on that reality that because of the gospel you are seen by God and reflect on that reality, the reality that you are heard by God. See, one of the mysterious, almost, works of the Spirit is that when you believe the gospel, the Spirit takes the gospel and implants it in your heart. Presses it into your heart. And Paul explains it this way in Romans chapter 5. That as a child of God, what the Spirit of God is doing in your life is it's taking the love of God and pouring it out in your heart constantly. That's what the Spirit's work in your heart is. It's to remind you that you are a child of God. That's why he's called the Spirit of Adoption. That's why he's called the, the seal of your inheritance, which is the kingdom. He's constantly pressing those truths upon you. It's true, you're a child of God. It's true, you're an heir of the kingdom. It's true, the gospel is true. And then we get to Romans chapter 8, and what do we do in light of this reality that the Spirit is pressing upon us, the reality of our adoption, we turn around and we say, Ah, Father. Why would the Spirit cause you to call God, Abba, Father, the same words Jesus used in the garden when He's screaming out to the Father, Rescue me, Abba, Father, the same words Jesus used. Why would the Spirit give you that word if the Father wasn't listening for that word? The Spirit presses the truth of your adoption on your soul that you would respond to that truth and live in the experience of the reality I have a father the, the, the same way a child a, a, as they develop there, there, there is a moment where, where they look into the eyes of their parent and they realize, I need you. I exist. You exist. Feed me. The same thing happens in your soul with God. 
When he presses your identity into your life by the power of the Spirit. And this is why the Word of God has to be central in your prayer life. Because that's where he's doing it. The Spirit wrote the Word of God. And he presses it in your life. And you go, oh, I exist. I am a child of God. Abba, help me. That is the experience of adoption. That is the experience of the gospel in your prayer life. To cry out to God, understanding that you have the same rights to be heard as Jesus. Why? He sees you the same way He sees Jesus. Often, dads ask me, like, what what advice would you give me as a dad? Like, how how do you make it through this stage? Kids are little. Times are crazy. And I've narrowed it down to one word. For dads. Presence. That's it. Just be there. You're going to do a lot of stupid things as a dad. Make a lot of mistakes. But I guarantee you this. If you're just there. See your kid. See them. Look at them. Put the phone away. Put the work away. Put it away. Look at them. Don't wait to the wedding day. Don't wait to the graduation moment. Don't wait to the wow, amazing thing on the athletic field or the grades to see them. In moments where they're not holding something up to you to say, look, Dad, look at them. See them and hear them. Hear them. Why? 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 Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why is this color? What's this? What? What? Listen to them. All that babbling. That is. It it is insanely inconvenient and annoying. But the Spirit of God is saying, you do the same thing to God constantly. Why, Why is this? 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 Why are you doing that? To be heard? So will around in the back seat and look them in the eye and hear them. Hear them. The sky's blue because God made it that way. I've already told you 50 times. <laughs> Listen to them, talk to them, present. Why? Because that's what you need from God, and He's provided that for you. And so, in the same way we reflect adoption, we reflect presence. In our kids' life. And where do we experience the presence of our Father? Where are we seen by our Father in heaven who is holy, who is righteous? And that's why it's so glorious that we can look at Him and say, Father, in prayer. We may get irritated with our children. Look at me, listen to me. Our Father in Heaven is never irritated. And Jesus says, no, let's say our Father. Because I want to invite you. Let's spend some moments in prayer right now before our Father. I'll close this in prayer, but in these moments, I want you to reflect on the fact that God is your Father in Christ. Reflect on the truth and reality that He sees you and that He hears you, that He knows you and that He loves you.